believe that this is the session that will allow us to kind of tie all the pieces and parts together from the morning sessions all the way through the afternoon. So uh, this is really a critical component of what we've been talking about all day. Joining me here on the stage, uh, we have Lydia Dobbins, President, CEO of New Tech Network. Hi, Lydia. Uh, we also have Mike McGurr, Upstate Local Agricultural Entrepreneur. Mike, thanks for being with us. Uh, Anne Marie Styritz, who is the President and CEO of the South Carolina Council on Competitiveness, and Ernest Andre, Executive Director of the South Carolina Digital Corridor. Thank you. Uh, let me start with you, Anne Marie. We talk about demographics in the 21st century and innovation hubs and the great sorting out. You know, we, we look back probably a decade ago, it's pretty easy to find these innovation hubs Silicon Valley, Austin, uh, the Research Triangle. These are almost kind of old, worn cliche. We see new innovation hubs popping up in places like Louisville, uh, Pittsburgh, even Dayton, Ohio. But what are, are the, the conditions uh, that exist there in those particular places where innovation not only starts to, to take off, but really thrives? Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for that. And that's interesting. Dayton, Ohio is my hometown, so that's is interesting that, right? that you raised that. But um, I, I think we're at an exciting point here in South Carolina as it comes to this. But I do think when we talk about this and how communities position themselves for innovation, and you're going to talk to the folks that are really uh, engaged in, in getting it done and, and building these kind of ecosystems, um, first I think we have to get over the infatuation with Silicon Valley. I, I think it's a unique set of circumstances. I think it's its own characteristics. I think the types of communities that you have called out um, have figured out what it is that they have that they can then turn into these types of opportunities. Because they the, had to reimagine. In many absolutely. Ways. I think right? what's going on in Detroit is going to be very interesting. Well, because it's well. a blank slate. Uh, it, uh, somewhat, yes. Right. Yes. So, um, but, th but there are certain, I think, uh, possibly necessary but not sufficient conditions that I, th I think we can look at common characteristics what are uh, in this. Um, First of all, I think there's a culture that is. Uh, some of the things that we have found that perhaps we lack somewhat in South Carolina that folks up here are involved in creating, uh, others certainly in this room have been involved in it. Um, we don't have a lot of, um, and if we're talking about innovation, meaning startups, commercialization, technology-based types of economic development, if that's what we're meaning when we define that. Um, it's not just the technology talent, it's also the business talent that knows how to operate those types of businesses. It's different than a corporate approach. It's how do you do this in a serial basis? How, how do you help a company start up and scale? It's a different kind of mentality. Capital is one issue. We've done capital market studies, but again, Silicon Valley is a different thing. You have a lot of private capital, venture capital. If you look at other places, if we think about, well, what are the types of ecosystems we're trying to drive, there's different kinds of capital needs for different areas. You mentioned uh, Cleveland, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh has a really interesting kind of industry mix. Silicon Valley is software heavy in a lot of ways, and there's a different kind of capital that's needed. If you think about software uh, startups, that's kind of front end, uh, early investment, startup there. Compare that to a life science or a biotech focus where you need long, patient, multiple rounds of capital. So, so I think there's different kinds of capital. And we're talking about innovation, but let me wrap into entrepreneurship because since we're trying to bring it together, I have an example from the Promise Zone sure. that I think is something we need to think about. We've been part of the Council on Competitiveness, has been one of those partners that's been at the table. Um, uh, for the Promise Zone. Um, we have been involved in some grant applications, some we've led, uh, some we've partnered on. But we were at one of the um, strategic planning sessions that was brought together, and we had subdivided ourselves out into, self-selected, into some of the pillar areas that we were looking at. And there was one table that was empty. And we looked around, and it was private capital. And when we're in that context, we're not talking about venture capital there. We're talking about can we get banks to come in and make loans in a community. So, so when we talk about capital needs in the state, I think it's very contextual. And, and I know we're primarily talking about a lot of the technology-based um, activity in the state. 
but I do think as we're taking the broader view of what do we need to move the whole state forward, we have to understand those different kinds of contexts. Um, the last thing we need is that broadband infrastructure, but we can talk about that later. Well, I know and, and before I move on and ask anybody else a question, you know, you think about entrepreneurship, you know, what makes big, splashy headlines, typically with jobs, you know, things like Volvo, Continental Tire, sure. and rightly so. I mean, it does make for a good headline, 4,000 jobs for Berkeley County, you know, 1,800 jobs for Sumter County. But the real driver of economic growth is still small business, yep. that entrepreneurial spirit, is it not? Uh, it is, but as you saw with Joey, what we've seen post-recession, we do a lot of work with Dr. Von Nessen, as you saw. Um, it's kind of particular subsectors that we're seeing. But, le but let me give an example. The reason is this isn't an either or, um, is because we're doing a lot of work right now around developing the aerospace cluster in the state. Obviously, Boeing gets the headlines. Well, we've worked with Dr. Von Nessen and have done a deep dive trying to reach out to the aerospace community in the state. We kind of knew, we knew there was aerospace activity in the state prior to Boeing's arrival. We didn't really know what that looked like, and certainly Boeing was the catalyst. Well, we were able to work with Dr. Von Nessen and identify 400 aerospace-related companies in the state, many of whom are small businesses, whom we wouldn't have known about if we hadn't done, looked at and done this kind of analysis, 400. And a lot of them aren't supplying Boeing, but they're here. So who are they? And when we were talking about how do small and medium-sized companies leverage and find opportunities, that's a lot of the work that we do. That's what developing kind of formalized industry clusters looks like, is how do we pull together all of those in the supply chain so the c catalyst that something like a BMW or a Boeing can create is some of that small business creation. So it doesn't have to be the either or in terms of where are we gonna focus. What we do need is a broader and more comprehensive economic development approach uh, in our understanding of the state. We'll get back to broadband because that's a yep. topic that I'm intensely interested in, a place where I think the co-ops can help. Ernest, uh, the South Carolina uh, Digital Corridor, uh, briefly explain what it is and why it was even developed in the first place. <clears throat> well, Mike, um, thank you. First of all, I'm happy to be with all of you today. Um, I think that um, typically economic development, bold economic development initiatives tend to occur around some sort of crisis. But this, the, the silent crisis in Charleston is, you know, while we were celebrating the tourism economy and all the good things happening, what we were seeing is uh, cost of living rising at about a 12% rate and wages at about a 2% rate. And I'm being aggressive on the wages. So, uh, you know, fortunately, we have a very visionary leader, who, you know, you're going to hear from him tomorrow, Joe Riley, and I went to him and I said, boss, you know, we've got a little bit of a problem, you know, we can't, we can't be, afford to become the next Cleveland or Detroit or who just focused on a one-track pony, so to speak, and, you know, ultimately went down, you know, so we need a diverse economic strategy. And, uh, you know, I think that, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of provocative when I say this, but we, we cannot, in South Carolina, we should celebrate what we have and not get become part of the race to the bottom, which is out incentivizing the next state and then basically wondering why we end up where we end up. So we really have to focus on, and that's fine. I mean, I think we, it's part of a diverse strategy. So what we said is, we're gonna take Charleston. And I'll tell you basically, we didn't need a million dollar study to tell us what we have in Charleston as a lifestyle cluster. Right. People just wanna be there. Right. So the reality well, is, evident, right? okay, there's, 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 some, there's some fundamental things that kind of started and that was let's close that gap. There were three underlying principles that we had that we live by today. To raise the per capita, to diversify the economy, and to create opportunities for our graduates, primarily the engineering and science related graduates. Because a lot of the liberal arts graduates stay, they go into law, medicine, finance, restaurant, hotel, you know, hotel administration, that kind of thing. But what are we doing with the science graduates? These are investments that the state is making in our students. Let's create the opportunities. So I think the, what is it? It was really focused on just building a high wage economy. And you can talk about high impact companies and you can talk about all these wonderful things. There is no company that is 15 years old in Charleston, South Carolina, that has made a $25 million gift to MUSC. And there probably won't be one anytime soon. So Benefit Focus, which is 15 years old, the CEO, when they went public, made, wrote a check to the, to the Children's Hospital and that, to me, is what a software economy will kind of build you. The other thing is basically what we said. Uh, it took a gentleman from Manhattan to kind of crystallize this for me. He says, Ernest, 
There are four historic peninsula cities in the country. Right. Boston, Manhattan, San Francisco, and Charleston. And I'm like, oh my God, the light bulb just went off. There's a certain under underlying sense of vibrance. There's a sense of place. But we also have a sense of scale. And ultimately, you know, for a guy who was born and raised in Kuwait, I didn't want to leave. I wanted, I was hooked. So what I needed to do was build that economy for our entire community and a lot that allowed me to stay there. So the, the, the what is the, the need to basically address those three things. The where we are, and I'm gonna jump right to this because we can talk around these issues all we want to, but the digital quarter is basically has manifested itself in some pretty solid results. We've grown from 18 companies to 350 plus today. And you don't read, you're exactly right, Mike. Media is trained to grab the headline. The new darling is Volvo, and, and admittedly so. I'm not taking anything away. But what happens basically when you also have these software companies that are spinning up? I've got three new building, three new companies in our, in, in our incubator facility. They'll be with me for one year, and they might just end up on King Street, like People Matter did or uh, Fish Labs did most recently, with taking 30,000 square feet. So the true test is, let's come back to why we did this. The average wage at our companies We've been doing these surveys since 2003. They're self-reported by the companies. Is $70,000. That's almost twice the per capita. The companies have grown pretty aggressively. And if entrepreneurship, the true test of entrepreneurship, in my opinion, is ultimately the exit, right? So no newspaper in Charleston, South Carolina, reported that in 2007, a billion dollars, $996 million, came into our economy as companies were sold. It's a billion dollars basically by software, exclusively in the software industry. So again, I think that we have, we have to train our media to focus on these issues. And as long as we can get them to weight things equally, including risk, then I think we win. But, but, but the bottom line is, I want, to, I want to just say that we are winning and we have to celebrate this, the, these wins. You just need a mega, bigger megaphone in other words, right? Sure. Well, I think, I think that, you know, what I would say is you asked the question about the clusters. There was a publication that recently ranked Charleston as one of the top 10 software communities in the country. Right? So I, I don't want to leave Charleston out of the conversation. I don't want to leave the fact that the innovation division of the state of South Carolina has been doing some fantastic things in the last two years. Investing in every, every pocket of this economy. You know, I, I just last week I got a call from Florence and I think it was Spartanburg to talk about our code education program. So I think that there are some really wonderful things going on and we, 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 we have to celebrate some of these things along the way. Mike, let's talk about uh, your initiative. Um, the sustainable food movement, the local food movement has been much talked about here in the last five years. A lot more people know about it. Kudos to the Department of Agriculture here in South Carolina for cultivating an awful lot of that and supporting that because I think that's important. It's been a really successful campaign, but tell the crowd a little bit about what it is you are trying to accomplish in this realm of food, connecting farmers to markets, I mean, very innovative stuff that you're thinking about. Well, the, uh, the marketplace in South Carolina for locally produced edible products is enormous and virtually untapped. Uh, South Carolina spent about $11 billion on food, uh, just consuming food in 2014 alone, and over 90% of that was on food that came from outside of South Carolina. So that gives you an idea that there's around $9.25 billion worth of opportunity uh, in the local food uh, arena. Um, the vast majority of farmers in South Carolina sell their products in a traditional manner uh, that goes back uh, decades and generations. Uh, they take their crops to the auction house, they take their crop or their animals to the sale barn, and they basically sell their product right there on the spot to a broker, to a buyer, at the lowest price that the buyer can get it at. Um, those buyers are brokering that product on through numerous additional uh, markets uh, in the commodities market and uh, in the regional uh, food production system. 
uh, there's so much margin that is available, it's, it's basically immeasurable for what local food production can do to increase the profitability of South Carolina farmers. And in some instances, uh, you know, that's a, that's a four acre organic high intensive uh, grocery oriented uh, production uh, farm. In other instances, it's 400 acres or it's 4,000 acres worth of grain that we need for the craft brewing uh, industry, uh, for the distilling industry, for biodiesel. Uh, there are uh, such a variety of business opportunities across a full spread of agricultural production and a full spread of food and edibles production that it staggers the mind as, as you start to get involved in it. Trying to approach the economic opportunity with the Department of Commerce and bridging the gap between ag and commerce is one of the biggest challenges. Um, they report agricultural jobs differently. You know, when you look at the jobs reports, it always says non-agricultural sector. Well, <laughs> those are jobs. There's a lot of reasoning behind it. But these are, these are huge opportunities for people to better their own families as well as to employ their community. One of the other opportunities that we found is that, uh, especially with Greenville County Schools, uh, Spartanburg, uh, Pickens County Schools, the institutional buying power of those, uh, of those systems is also enormous. It's almost immeasurable. In uh, 2014, Greenville County purchased, excuse me, um, I think $14 million worth of raw produce for the K through six uh, uh, classes. That is uh, an enormous opportunity just within Greenville County with a small number of our students to be able to purchase fresh edibles from our local uh, farms to get into our local bellies. And that's important because that food that would ordinarily be sold out of the state becomes highly processed outside of the state. It gets lots of sodium, lots of high fructose corn syrup, sugars, other additives. Then it comes back in the form of processed food for our school children to be eating. And we all know that obesity and diet-related illnesses are one of the most uh, prevalent, if not the most prevalent concern um, in our state right now, especially in our communities of need. And so the opportunity to help reorient the production of edible products on our farms to more market relevant, more industry relevant types to help those farmers make it from where they're currently uh, operating to embracing, it's gonna be scary, some regulatory services uh, to help assure that their product can be sold with safety into that institutional market so that we're not spreading, you know, uh, illnesses to our kids. Um, to help those two things happen at the same time as opening up those schools to start to purchase those products that are now market relevant and certified so that they can get into our children's bellies and keep the economy of that production system within the state that's an enormous opportunity. Yeah, but here's the deal, Mike, and one of the big hurdles here, you're talking about farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I hate to paint a broad brush about any type of group, but I can safely say that farmers are very slow to change for the most part. You know, these are guys that have done things the same way over and over and over. Mm -hmm. Is that one of your biggest challenges to say, hey, guys, there's a huge opportunity here if you just reorient your thinking a little bit. There's got to be a, a different kind of sales job for you. It is. It's, it's, it's an enormous challenge. Um, the bigger challenge is actually working with the market, with working with the institutional buyers and working with Aramark, with Chartwells, with the different uh, you know, food service organizations. To these are big corporations. With they're a massive turf, multinational. Turf to protect. Absolutely. But they want local product. In other states, in other regions of the country, there are programs that are extremely successful of getting product from you know, the state into the same uh, uh, companies I just mentioned within the, their own states. We just don't have the processing capacity here to basically take heads of lettuce, or rather heads of broccoli, 
uh, wash them, cut them up, and bag them so that they're relevant to the users. It's basically supply chain management. Because it has to be used rather quickly. It has to be used quickly, and it has to be used uniformly. So the, the, the organization that we are building in Greenville reflects our geography. It's very different than the one that's in Charleston that's being developed in Catawba and in Aiken in Columbia. Um, the, the, the basis of ours is processing because uh, through um, 10 at the top, gratuitous plug, 10 at the top has helped us convene uh, uh, upstate food systems meetings over the past two and a half years where we've had over 1,500 unique contributors to the process of determining what are the key things that we are lacking and what are the key strengths that we have in order to start to reorient this. Processing is the absolute number one answer across all sectors. And so our facility is going to have uh, a basic washing, grading, sorting, repacking uh, uh, facility in order to get that agricultural product from the farms directly into our county school system. Lydia, New Tech Schools, we talk about K through 12 education. Some folks would say, well, geez, is there a place there to learn about entrepreneurship? I mean, that doesn't seem like, you know, the uh, traditional curriculum per se, but at New Tech Schools, there's a very vibrant place for just that uh, sort of endeavor. Explain that if you would, please. Well, I think if you <clears throat> listen to the, the three panelists up here with me who each described a problem and an entrepreneurial solution to try to think about that. That's exactly what project-based learning as the primary mode of teaching and learning in a school at any grade level can help, uh, can help a student learn to discover uh, his or her passion, a connection to the community, uh, develop the, the sort of um, growth mindset that says, I can try, I can fail, I can try again, uh, and that the, these are all characteristics and attributes that are essential no matter what your pursuit is uh, in a, in a post-secondary way. Um, but I would say the key to this is you have to uh, suspend your disbelief that entrepreneurialism can be taught at, without it being at the expense of all the other things we hold near and dear, uh, like uh, academic accomplishment and, and the sort of traditional sense of being able to demonstrate you know something. Uh, and the other big piece that, that we often find is that we have, uh, the public doesn't quite believe teachers can teach entrepreneurialism. And so what we're also talking about is to work with, and, and we're thrilled that, that in nearly 200 schools around the country, where 90% of them are public district schools, that this interest in graduating a different kind of student has called for these communities to invest in the teachers and the principals in the central office to reimagine what teaching and learning can be so that our students graduate with great uncertainty about the future they'll face, but having the skills to know they can respond to problems, they can be adaptive, they might discover they love entrepreneurialism and that's the path they want to go down, um, but that's a choice they get to make rather than struggling to find uh, meaningful employment for a family that they might want to raise in the community they grew up in. You know, one of the things that employers be most concerned about in today's job market with young people, or one of the, the, the big values they are looking for, the ability to collaborate, mm -hmm. the ability to communicate clearly about what it is you are doing, uh, because sometimes people, you know, they have big ideas and big thoughts but don't know how to get their message across. Collaboration, communication, two big keys, you think, of what a new tech school is all about. I mean, those are those are not soft skills in my estimation, even though some educators would say, uh, yeah. I hate the term soft skills. I do too. Um, uh, but it's the re world we have to live in. So we think this is so important to combine knowledge and thinking with these other skills that are collaboration, communication, and student agency. That ability to be responsible for my own learning. Accountability. And, and yeah, accountability and so forth. That those are what they should be graded on in everything they do. So in our schools, those multiple learning outcomes are visible to students, to their parents. Uh, teachers learn to develop projects in which they grade on each of those areas. So that means teachers have to know how do you grade agency, 
you know, we can imagine how you might uh, grade public speaking or presentation and so forth, but that's, that's that kind of re-imagining uh, what teaching looks like to be able to think about if their skills we say they're important, they have to be graded in the same way. Not that they're weighted in the same way. I'm not saying that, you know, if you can be a consummate public speaker but don't know anything, that that's okay. But I'm saying if you know something, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're going to talk second. about politics. What are you saying? But, um, <laughs> Uh, what, I, what I am saying, though, and we heard it from the a gentleman who spoke earlier from BMW, uh, engineers who can't put a sentence together are, are difficult to imagine employees they want to invest in. So we help students understand one without the other will hold you back. When you can connect all of those learning outcomes together, then you choose where you want to go as you think about life after school. Yes, I'm familiar with that. Um, I work a lot with engineers who uh, need to get a point across, and it takes a great deal of time. And I say that with all love because my dad was an engineer, so I'm used to it. Ernest, are there other communities you think in South Carolina as you travel around that can emulate what has been done in Charleston and the efforts that have been made there? I mean, is this something that can be replicated in other places? With not, not can, it is being. I think uh, well, they've got initiatives in Myrtle Beach, they've got initiatives in Greenville with Next, uh, you've got the Grand Strand Tech Council, you know, you've got initiatives in Florence. Uh, I think, you know, what's very important, uh, Mike, on this is you actually have to have entrepreneurs drive these initiatives. So it's really interesting, they can relate because the folks who are basically driving these initiatives are entrepreneurial and they can better relate to their own, you know, the business people. So um, the, the other thing basically that's very interesting as opposed to big business, which is highly competitive, cloaked under a, a, a you know, cloud of secrecy, everything we do is open source. So we're gonna collaborate with uh, the Department of Commerce on a product that's gonna soon be released on something that we did that showcases all the innovative companies in South Carolina in one place. And you'd be able to get the information in about 10 seconds. And you know, if you find one, Mike, that, that wasn't on the list, you can add that, list, that company yourself. That is taking a completely open approach to it and showcasing. So whether you're in 96 South Carolina, Charleston, Bamberg, if you got something interesting going on, there's somebody in Bamberg maintaining networks with somebody over there. They've got technical skills and we want to know about it. There's somebody installing Wi-Fi networks in, in every little corner of the state. So I think that um, we have designed our entire this, the entire program and the entire systems are designed to share. What is interesting is up to recently with, with, uh, with the launch of the Innovation Division of the State of South Carolina, we were sharing that with Purdue, we were sharing that with Tennessee, we were sharing that with Florida, we were sharing with North Carolina. My, my, my engagements are all outside the state. And now I'm starting to see them increase within the state. So I think it's very encouraging. The other thing I, I want to say, since this is about basically entrepreneurship, the conference about entrepreneurship <clears throat> to some extent, is what we realized is there are a lot of other people who might, so, so Lydia's saying, you know, we're going to start really early and work them, work them up. Our position is very simple, that until the quarter was launched 15 years ago, so it seems like forever, uh, there was no true support for, the, for entrepreneurs. So we said we were gonna provide it to them and when it wouldn't be covered, so it, it was novel in the day, we created our own news publication because we could do it digitally. So if you go to Charleston Digital News, you can kind of see news about the tech economy in Charleston. We didn't have to wait until I realized the local papers were starting to source information from our outlet. Today, the, today you got social media to kind of take care of that. But it's kind of interesting to see just by pushing the envelope and showing Charleston as, you know, with all these people coming down, uh, they said, man, I'd love to have my business here if, you know, if, if, if I had the resources. So uh, we opened up, the city made a small $120,000 investment in, fla in the flagship, which was our first business incubator. These companies, have, we've, we've gone through 78 of them so far, and, uh, out of, and our failure rate is 6%. They're all in the, in the, in the community operating some doing extremely well, some, some qualifying under the high impact statement that was made by uh, the, the professor from, uh, from, from USC. 
So I think, uh, you know, anybody who wants to do anything like this can come get a front row seat. No trade secrets. And, and, and that is, that, that is a, a very refreshing approach, you know. So you have a lot of the conversation about strategy. Well, we're all about the execution. Anne-Marie, as we talked about technology, the digital mm -hmm. corridor, that leads us into what you wanted to talk about being broadband. And that'll be part of our conversation tomorrow morning about infrastructure broadly, uh, because America lags behind in many ways in terms of broadband, uh, not just in South Carolina, not just in rural areas, but really the entire country. When people get excited about Google Fiber, and you go to Europe, you go to China, you know, been there, done that, sorry. But broadband specifically for you, what are you working on at the council, and what kind of opportunities exist there? Well, I am trying to think about is this something that we need to work on in the council? And I'll tell you, it's because, you know, when you're sitting at the state, uh, state level, we're, we're a private sector entity, we're a nonprofit, so we're not state government. Um, and we carry out our work through partnerships. We're, we aren't a large organization. All of our work is done through partnerships. But I've heard, probably within the past month, from different areas and different types of individuals trying to do this work, we've got to address this issue. I'm having technology constraints in, in my ability to grow, my ability to scale. It has implications the in education. To educate, for Absolutely. Sure. It, it um, is, and I've heard this yeah, through, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, I, um, I heard it from a cybersecurity small business located in Charleston that said what we've had to go through to get technology, and this isn't a slam on Charleston, it exists in other ways, but um, what we had to go through to get the infrastructure in place that we need to scale and grow this company, a South Carolina grown company working in high tech, high promise, much needed uh, area of our state has this challenge. I heard it come up from a legislator asking the Secretary of Commerce during a budget presentation, hey, this is an issue for us. Is there anything that can be done around it? We heard it from the promise zone. It's not an urban versus rural thing. This is a larger uh, issue. So is there a coalition in here somewhere, given the different interests coming to the table? And certainly a lot of the work around education. Think about virtual delivery of education. That's well, right. that implies there's an infrastructure in place to do that. And we do have a, a wonderful virtual school um, here in South Carolina, but do students have access to this? We, we house some of the, you that are involved in education in the state probably know about the Transform SC initiative. That's housed under us. Riley Institute's a great partner. Arts, uh, Arts Commission is as well, Arts Alliance. Um, but this idea of blended learning, technology-based learning, anytime, anywhere, access, real-time assessment and feedback to our educators so that uh, they can do this. And students can learn at home. All of these kinds of things, this idea of moving toward a personalized learning model assumes, I think, in there, a certain amount of access and facility that depends on technology. Well, yeah, I mean, um, look, at the end of the day, in a globalized economy, how do you expect your children to keep up with the rest of the world if they don't have access to high-speed internet? But Lydia, you almost jumped out of your seat. I, well, it's... <laughs> so. Try to be polite. Um, I, I think that when we talk about um, the opportunity gap, th this is, you know, if we can't solve this, uh, and that by this I mean not just broadband access, but uh, the supports to be able to make good use of that access. Uh, and that is investing in both infrastructure and in the design of schools and learning. Um, you know, we see a great intersection of project-based learning and personalized learning. Um, and it is both from the teaching standpoint where you can learn more about what, where a student is and what a student needs as it is from students directing their own learning letting their own passion and interest uh, be the way in which they take advantage, uh, whether they're rurally based or in an urban or suburban setting. So if you can't, can't make sure that there is equal access and it's as important it be outside of the classroom and you know on the weekends, uh, then you are contributing to that opportunity gap getting bigger and bigger. Okay, for the audience now, um, to get you involved, uh, to have you to be part of the conversation. Um, if you have a question that you would like to ask one of the panelists, 
There are uh, pieces of paper, pens on the table. Please write that down, and then one of the Riley staff members will come around. If you would just hold it up, they'll grab it, sort through it, we'll look through them, and then we'll ask questions of the panelists here while we continue our conversation. Uh, so please, if you have a question of anyone up here about anything you've heard, just raise that card up, and we'll come by and grab them, and then we'll uh, keep that going. Uh, Lydia, one more question here for you before we get to the questions in the audience. Outcomes for new tech schools, I know there's been a lot of research done. Uh, we have a lot of evidence to suggest much success, and I think that's probably something you'd like to share with the audience. I, uh, anytime I get to talk about new tech is a happy time. Um, we, we, we get asked this question a lot, especially by school board members, and as someone who was very active in my community and served eight years on a school board, you know, you're talking about both the uh, investment of money and the, the trust and confidence that a new program or a new approach Which is, always scary in is going right? to uh, both meet the promise and what will it mean for my children or our community's uh, children. And I'll, I'll say a couple of things about that. A um, lot of conversation right now about are we measuring what really matters in schools? So I am someone who will say, when the only thing we measure are standardized tests that don't have relevance in the real world, we're not measuring what really matters to our students. I, and I'll add to that and say we know how to measure things that can be an important indication of growth, both at the individual level and to see how students do. So I'm somebody who believes strongly in investing in ways that what we measure can be meaningful to a teacher at a time that they can do something with that information. Um, and I think if we move from the punitive sense of accountability to a shared, transparent way of knowing whether what we're doing works, that's a good move for education in, in general. So we do measure both um, uh, in traditional ways and in ways that I think have a lot of promise, both formative assessments, which is to say having students uh, be able to demonstrate their knowledge uh, aligned to college ready work uh, in each discipline and to be able to have that be just part of the instruction. Students don't stop the learning <laughs> to do this and go back to the learning and I think that's such an important part of a culture. Um, we, we have graduates from our high schools who graduate 9% uh, 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 higher than the national rate across all locales. We have a going to college rate that is significantly higher, especially in uh, areas of uh, first generation college going. And we have the persistence rate in college, both two and four years, that's considerably higher. Um, and, and those are the things people latch on to. They are important, but I would hate for those to be the only way we look at are we serving our students. Um, so we also like to we survey cultures. So we have culture of the adult learning culture and the student culture, and that's done two or three times a year to help schools know how they're being perceived by their clientele. Um, we also participate in something called the College Work Readiness Assessment to be able to know from freshman year to senior year how much growth is there for that incoming freshman to the time when they graduate and how does it compare to, to students who are freshmen in college. And these are the ways that we can say when things are going well, we can point to these results and say this is it. And when the, the results aren't there, we know there's something to look at in that school that's worth understanding why aren't they happening. And, and to be able to take those measures. And important to know, you know, those first new tech schools, the first two, really in counties marked by persistent poverty, at least Clarendon County for sure. I don't know about Collin mm -hmm. County, but close. Uh, but, you know, very rural areas in need of a different view, a different way of education. Yeah. And, and we, of course, um, are very encouraged by some of the early um, feedback. We're early in this implementation in both those schools, right. um, but there are some really strong gains in a number of key areas that have us feeling um, pretty excited about what this will mean long term in these communities to be able to meet those students' needs. At events like this, I'm a big fan of takeaways, so people have something to take away with them to hang on to. You have some takeaways in the back of the room, some information uh, about outcomes. Yeah, there's a 
but since everybody bought something from the artist and you're already figuring out how you're going to get those home, uh, but there's a large infographic that really breaks out um, the way that we look to measure both the growth of students and how those perform, and we'd be delighted to have those Great. go home. Those are there people. in the back of the room uh, yeah. near the door if you'd like to grab one of those on the way out. Uh, Mike, wave a magic wand and say, you know, because we can do that at events like this. Um, what one agency, what one group, um, where do you, who do you need help from the most that can get you going to the place where you really want to be in two, three, four years? Where's the roadblock and what can people do to help? You tell me. It's a great question. I've never actually been asked that one before. Um, you know, it's going to be parents and it's most likely parents who are engaged in uh, Title I schools to get engaged. But uh, that's get your a children. big, big issue in Title I schools. It is, parent yeah. engagement. That's right. Uh, we're working right now with the Head Start in, uh, in Greenville on a pilot project. Uh, we have uh, 12 different collaborative partners, uh, very much in the spirit of what a lot of people have talked about today, including yourself, you know, about uh, using other people's organizations. We're a facilitator, really, when it comes down to it. So. Uh, there are about 12 different organizations engaged in executing a pilot project with the Head Start, 220 students' families, and they're about uh, two-thirds of the way through the, through the first pilot, which was funded by Greenville Health Systems. Thank you, Mr. Riordan. And uh, the second uh, phase uh, was just announced to us last night that is going to be funded by TD Bank. Um, so we're enthused. Um, the, the project basically is a parent engagement tool. Uh, in the context of a farm to school project for the three to five year old children that are uh, serviced by this Head Start. Uh, the particular Head Start we chose is approximately 60% African American, 30% Latino, and 10% white. The students in alternating weeks receive a recipe kit of uh, all the ingredients needed to execute a, uh, a family recipe, so green bean casserole or uh, uh, mustard greens with, uh, with tomatoes or okra stew. Um, the recipes themselves were actually derived from the neighborhood surrounding the Head Start and were nutritionally balanced by the Greenville Health System's CCI group uh, in terms of uh, reducing the sodium, making them healthier, reducing the, uh, uh, the fat and uh, increasing the freshness of the ingredients. The purpose of this is for us to, one, educate the children to help the children in the communities that are blended within this facility to adopt one another's foods in some way, and three, measure what that adoption rate is, what those ingredients are, because I want to program that with my farmers. The kids take the packages home with their parents. They cook them uh, over the weekend, and then on Mondays they have curriculum in the Head Start that elicits uh, reaction and gets data. And then in the following week, uh, all the ingredients that the students had received in the context of a bilingual uh, package of uh, one recipe arrive in a farmer's market um, set up in the cafeteria. The students then go through with their parents and they select the products that they actually want. So we find that most of the cilantro gets left behind <laughs> and, yeah, and uh, most of the carrots and the potatoes get picked up. But the adoption rates of those products and the increase in how those products are adopted into those families is what's really critical to us and from the health system and from the, uh, uh, and from the uh, Clemson uh, researchers who are on this project with us, uh, we're able to identify those products that we really can grow and start to orient the, uh, the, the families toward purchasing those products at the mobile market that will come to the school with their SNAP dollars, their EBT dollars, their WIC dollars, uh, to create a family experience for the adoption of new fresh foods in food deserts. Um, the, the sum of it all is that that information is then going to be utilized in the execution of pilots, uh, one of which is uh, with Mr. Spinks over there. and so. Uh, the Sphinx gas stations in many cases in uh, the upstate fall within food deserts. And so we are working with the Clemson students um, in about seven different service learning uh, categories at Clemson, along with Berman uh, Shy Center um, fellows and a couple of interns to 
test those same systems and products with the families that surround the Sphinx station that's going under renovation this year so that we can know what products they would like to see reflected from their community in the store that they're effectively using as their grocery store because there is no grocery in the area. Right. That's scalable and that engages on so many different layers and so many different levels of uh, opportunity. Uh, so we're looking for people to come in and find their opportunity with us, take it on in the private sector and uh, come along with us. We'll get you the supply and we'll get you the market. We just need to figure out your part in it. I should probably have a more professional phrase for this, but that just sounds super cool to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for what it's worth. It's been a huge effort. Super cool. <laughs> yeah. I have a question for Ernest here from Table 20, and it's a, a good question about what efforts you think are underway to bridge the diversity gap that exists in the divisional slash high tech sector. This is a question that has been brought up before. Yeah, it's, uh, this is a big issue that's playing out in the West Coast, um, you know, with, with some, of, some of the most, you know, prominent names and some of the most mature tech companies. But, you know, uh, Mike, uh, what I like to do is, whether it's broadband or whether it's all these issues, I like to create these projects um, to test out strategies, you know, that are in the real world. So I have to race back tomorrow. I got here today, and I couldn't do it yesterday because we had Chromebooks coming in that basically were paid for by some of our members that are going to be deployed tomorrow with, with eight kids. Seven of those eight kids are minorities. I set a goal of 25% minority, 90% tomorrow. We just finished up a class. These are kids between 8 and 11. The last class basically was 80% minority and underprivileged. So somebody asked me, they said, well, how did you get all these kids? I just went to the inner city schools and I said, listen, I want a recommendation as to which kid basically has shown technical skills that they could benefit from a full ride. And it's something I don't do very often, but I just picked up the phone and I just randomly said, listen, I want, I want you to basically contribute a thousand bucks to full scholarship for this, you know, for this kid. And in two days I had $10,000 $10, basically. I started when, you know, with one of, the, one of the local attorneys in town that I don't really deal with, but I just said, let me see what Neil thinks about this. He's like, absolutely. He said, Ernest, you can't do it this way because if you want to scale this, send me something that I can share with 10 of the attorneys in my firm because we all should be doing this. But you, you just wanted to test the water, yeah, right? Yeah, so, so, um, so, so let, me, let me also um, uh, talk, about, talk to this issue because as I told somebody in the audience today, we were talking, I said, you've got to separate things that feel good to you as opposed to things that actually have an impact. And then once you know that they can have an impact, then you've got to figure out how to sustain them. So we started with CodeCamp after getting plenty of no's from the educational institutions. Today, this program started in May of 2012. Today, we have 1,800, 1,800 people have taken classes at CodeCamp between 6 and 8.30 at night at a flagship incubator. So they're being duly purposed, not just to support entrepreneurship, but also basically to support education. 700 unique students, meaning that some are taking more classes. So then we basically said last summer we created a Code Camp Kids program over the summer. But what I quickly figured out basically was it was dependent on volunteers to come in, and this is where you have to be very careful. Uh, we had 30% minorities. I wasn't managing at the time, but then when I started to get, I, I said, no, we've got to raise this, and I started to actively manage a little more, because this was something I wanted to see if we can, we can do this. So now we're running, you know, 70 to 90 percent, basically, of, of, of minorities and underprivileged kids. So my point being that uh, we are in the early stage of showing what can be done. One of the investors in it, you know, I just picked up the phone, Google said, you know, here's my credit card, go ahead and hit me, hit me for $5,000. Five of those kids tomorrow are going to be, and they start nine, and this is for a kid on a, on a sad day, sad day, they're taking a study from 9.30 to 3.30. And on the first day, they're in an open terminal. So this is not scratch. This is, you know, we're saying, you know, Google's got their own, you know, uh, program, basically. And, and this is a little beyond. They can rely on, uh, on, on, on volunteers. Our program is taught by a $180,000 software engineer. So we go from teaching adults. 
we've had 45 kids, 55 kids, 68 kids, basically less than one year. And I said, guys, this is really well and good, but you can't scale it, do it on a Saturday, because a lot of kids have their, their athletic programs. So um, we are working right now with the, outre with the after school coordinator, Charleston County, the school district, to basically take that same program and cut it into 32 sessions, one hour after school, at $25 where parents pay for that kaleidoscope program and put it in the middle school. And we're gonna basically try that with four schools and we are evolving from teaching kids to teaching the teachers. And I only had one requirement that every teacher who teaches has to be hand selected and they get paid five more dollars than they're making in their day job. So what we've learned is basically, one of the things that we learned along the way was that kids will learn better from people they're around. I mean, you talk, I'm, I'm sitting next to an educator, so I really have to, but, but these are all things, so, so, and we're not doing a summer program. We're not doing a summer program with volunteers because what we found was that became a babysitting program. Right. So I just said, we're not doing a summer program this year. And the parents are like, they're gasping. No, 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 you know, we're, we're, this is the real deal. You have to commit to it. So I think the, the issue is that I, 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 this came up earlier in the day when I was sitting over. There is no black program and white program. There's a program. And if we treat all the kids basically, you know, we cannot look at a little kid who doesn't have that kind of, you know, mindset and then kind of say, no, no, you know, we'll, so, so what we're saying is, you know, maybe it's because I'm brown, I don't know. I just, I don't have this black and white thing. I'm just like, just put them all in and let's teach them all and let's kind of give a little bit of remedial training. But there was one parent whose kid went to basketball in Somerville, which is 30 miles away, before coming to code camp at 9.30. So there are a lot of, you know, parents are committed and I don't, I just refuse to accept this whole notion of, uh, it is a challenge, but I also will make this statement. I'm, the tech industry, and this is, this is what I was telling you, the tech industry is moving super fast. And so really, you know, that's no excuse for some of the mature companies not to be basically creating these, their own training academies. But the companies in Charleston do not have the ability to stop long enough to absorb and train and do some of these things. So some of them basically allowing us to kind of you know do do these do these do these experiments, and the digital quarter was not an overnight success. It's been 15 years in the making, and now we're using sort of the bully pulpit, for lack of a better word, to focus on bringing minorities in. And now that I know that I can get 70 and 80 percent, the new ceiling is 50 percent. We will not run a program if we don't get 50 percent minority participation. That sets defective diversity stats. Fantastic. Um, this next question is uh, from one, I, one of my heroes, Terry Richardson of Barnwell. You had a good question here, and I'll, I'll field this to you, Lydia, since uh, you know, being an administrator at New Tech School. What about uh, tech school you know, education for what Mike is doing, you know, agriculture, farming? If we look at South Carolina, in that catch-all term, agribusiness, mm -hmm. it dwarfs every, every other industry. You know, in South Carolina, by far, and if you just do farming, it doesn't really catch up to tourism, but agribusiness is the biggest. Is there room in a new tech school for that kind of hands-on instruction for, for, for what Mike does? Yeah, I'll take that question and sort of turn it on its head. Um, mm -hmm. Tech is, to our school model, the way calculators are to thinking about how to be fast and uh, doing math work. It is not the end, it's a means. And uh, we don't have the tech portion of the day separate from learning. It's just part of what's learning. I can imagine mm -hmm. there, I, I probably rattle off a dozen ways in which oh, yeah. access to the internet, the ability to connect with other people, you know, even the idea that you're talking about and finding out what in that community are the recipes that families are using. So. I think the answer is not tech versus not tech. It's, first of all, does, do all children have access to the same kind of opportunities to learn, whether they have an interest in coding or in growing something? And then do we expose them to the kind of learning that is an inquiry-based, some call it hands-on, but inquiry-based learning, so we don't presuppose what they're good at or what they're interested in. And if you can bring that into the design of learning so that you're solving real problems, 
that are real to those students, no matter what their age is, um, you're not limiting whether someone could get really excited about growing and eating or cooking or, or thinking about coding. I mean, I, I, I think it's, even the conversation about STEAM concerns me sometimes. I, to me, a well-rounded education is one that doesn't limit what mm. students are exposed to. Amen. It's one that celebrates every <clears throat> facet of learning so that we can make sure that students that we serve discover a passion and feel connected to their community and have hope for a life that they couldn't imagine without school. That's a very hopeful note to end on.